Directors have a responsibility to steward company and state resources. Their decisions can make or break a sector. In today's In Focus program, we're joined by Sheila Kama, who in her new book shares insights on corporate governance, targeting policymakers, decision makers, civil society, think tanks, and stakeholders invested and interested in the welfare of the oil and gas and mining sector. Ms. Kama was the CEO of De Beers in Botswana and is currently a non-executive director of Tulo. With over 20 years experience in the oil and gas and mining sector, Sheila Kama is one of the most sought after advisors. She has advised African governments through the African Development Bank, as well as Asian and Latin American governments through the World Bank. I'm your host, Ngasuma Kanyeka. Ms. Kama, hello and welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having me. Considering your 20 years experience in the extractive sector, what are some of your comments regarding potential of the sector to transform African economies? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, we have to acknowledge that in many African countries, the extractive sector has already transformed many economies. Uh, it, take Botswana as an example, take Nigeria and the oil industry as another example, uh, and take your own country, gold, Tanzanite, and now gas. So I think we can say that in several countries on the continent, the extractives have really contributed to the economy. The real question is, is there much more that can be done? And if there is, what is it? So do please tell us what can be done? How do we maximize the potential of the sector? In, in my book, which is on corporate governance, I look at uh, the challenges through the lens of board of directors in the boardroom as the pinnacle, if you wish, of the hierarchy of corporate leadership and corporate governance. And here, I beg the question, what is the role of the board in ensuring that these resources are a force for good? And here, I focus primarily on the role of the boards of those companies in which African states have equity. And my sense is that much more can be done through strategic leadership, through a clearer sense of direction that takes the companies beyond just extraction to extract a much more value. And, and that is what I think is critical, is to look beyond the upstream and say, quite apart from revenue, quite apart from employment, quite apart from taxation, what are the others? And this is the role of the board, to ask these questions and to answer them by designing the necessary strategies to chart the path. In your experience, what are some of the key ingredients that such a strategy should have? So if, if again, we, we, we are clear that we are talking about companies in which the state has an interest, the state in that sense performs two roles. The state performs the role of regulating and saying, this is how this sector will be governed. And those regulations include uh, state-owned entities. Mm -hmm. The state also is a shareholder. And the issue I wanted to address was really of the state as a shareholder. The shareholder's most important task, I think, in the extractives is to take what nature has given the country and transform it into tangible benefits. Tangible benefits, not just for the current generation, but tangible benefits for the future. And I think the key thing here is to, for governments to ask themselves a question. When we have completed the extraction of these resources, how should the country look like? What should be the economics and social status of our people? This, I think, is the single most important thing that the board of directors on state-owned extractive entities should ask and answer. Everything else should be geared towards achieving that end state vision. And I, I feel that at present, we don't ask that question enough. We focus too much on primarily, if you mind, these are your conditions, we want this much tax. You know, these are the basics, to be honest. The fundamental question is, what is the end state vision? When Tanzania's Tanzanite has been fully exploited, what kind of Tanzania do we envision? When Ghana's gold has been fully exploited, what kind of Ghana do we envision? When all of the oil in Mozambique has been pumped, what is left? And that, I think, is the single most important question a board of directors must ask 
and develop a strategy for purposes of answering and delivering. You talk extensively about stewardship in your book, which I found quite insightful. Can you explain a little bit around what that means in terms of leadership in the continent? And how does that play a role in ensuring that the leaders within the sector and within the continent understand what that responsibility looks like and how they can shepherd resources towards meeting the sector and indeed the state's um, priorities? I chose that term very deliberately for two reasons. First, because these resources really are held uh, by the governments as custodians on behalf of the public. And the term stewardship implies responsible management would be the simplest way to define it. Therefore, here responsible management means acting in a way that is trustworthy. And by trustworthy, I mean worthy of the trust of the public to do the right thing. And that's why I'm so obsessed with the notion of responsible stewardship, because if the board does anything at all but fails to act responsibly and to manage carefully and to deliver to those that they represent, then fundamentally they have failed what is called their fiduciary duties, which is the duty of care to act on behalf of others' uh, benefits. So th that is basically what I mean. It's an interesting concept and indeed one that is uh, pertinent in the sector and within the African continent. I like that you picked up on the fact that, you know, they're stewards of public interest. And so my lead question now is, what is the role of public participation and why is that important in a sector such as extractor sector? First of all, you are dealing with public goods uh, in terms of public assets. Mm -hmm. So for all intents and purposes, the governments the regulators, the people that serve on these boards are just agents of the public. It is inconceivable you can represent me and at the same time deny me to have a voice. By definition, you are my voice, but you are not the substitute to speaking for myself. But more importantly, in being my voice, you can't represent me if you are not engaging me because then you don't know what matters to me. So public participation is critical because it enables those who represent the public to engage with the public and have an understanding of what the public is, uh, expectation is. But also they have a moral duty to then naturally engage the public on whatever issues and ac actions they undertake because that then translates into accountability. But you cannot be accountable to a silent audience uh, accountability and participation by definition implies a uh, public voice. And that's why in the extractives, given that these are public assets, it is inconceivable. You could say I'm stewarding these resources, but in the process I have silenced the people who own these assets. It's impossible. It's mutually exclusive to the notion of, of a stewardship. Indeed. Now, you were speaking about how it's important for the public to be engaged so that the stewards of public interest can understand and have an in-depth knowledge of what those public priorities are and what the public requires in terms of their aspirations when it comes to such a sector. That leads into a lot of conversation around transparency. And while that might be um, one of the contentious areas within the sector, but I'd like to hear a bit more about what are some of the important processes and capacity areas when it comes to transparency and how can we fully benefit from the extractive value chain as a whole, which you touched upon in one of your responses. In my mind, um, transparency as in disclosure for the sake of it is, is, in, is inadequate to deliver governance. And I make this point in my book that to the extent that extractive companies are transparent and disclose information, but disclose information that is formatted and structured in a way that does not speak to the language of the average person, that stops short of transparency. So I'm advocating that extractive companies go the extra mile 
and format their reports in a way that speaks to the average person, that they provide information which is not just for purposes of compliance with the law, but really for genuinely bridging a knowledge gap that makes that participation, that consultation, that more effective because we are no longer speaking across each other. We are actually speaking with each other, speaking the same language. So in my view, transparency per se is not a panacea. It's just the beginning of a much more important process, which is that we are transparent, not because we disclose, but we are transparent because we break down the information in a granular manner, but also in a language that speaks to the audience. So that's my uh, penny's worth then on transparency. Now then, the issue of uh, uh, benefits through the value chain. So this is a, a, an important but complex issue. It is important and has been recognized by the African leaders through the Africa mining vision and its tenets that the aspirations of our principles on the continent is and remains that as much of Africa's extractive resources must be processed on the continent as possible. The goal being, if you don't uh, simply uh, extract Guinea's iron ore and ship it to China, but instead process and, and, and manufacture, uh, first of all, process, produce iron ore, steel, and then produce goods that are made of steel. By definition, you got this snowball effect of creating jobs and, and uh, the jobs themselves pay salaries, the salaries pay tax, et cetera, et cetera, and there's infrastructure. Now, this is the perfect world. Suffice to say, the world is far from perfect, right? Indeed. And this, so that was the perfect, now here is the imperfect world. The imperfect world says, actually, the world of iron ore is not confined to Guinea. It's confined to several parts of the world. Some contribute finance to be able to finance these, these projects. Others contribute the technology to discover, to extract, to process. And then others uh, create the opportunity to manufacture uh, goods, build buildings, and so forth and so forth. And that's what's complex. And I think your audience can see how you couldn't have the banks only being in Guinea, the process, the people who uh, design the technology for exploration, mining and everything. So in a nutshell, what I've said is, we are part of a global world and our ability to be able to process and benefit right through the value chain is a function of how competitive we are at each one of those stages is the first thing. The second is the extent to which a market for the goods that come out of that value chain exist in our own continent is another limitation. There could be many other limitations, but as, as I said, it's a, you know, it's a mouthful. You've asked me a mouthful. I've, I've, I've done my best to answer it in a simplistic way. But, but really, in a nutshell, it is that it has different component parts. They, some sit in the supply space, some sit in the demand space. No one country, uh, with the exception perhaps of, Japan, of, of China in certain aspects, is able to offer all that. And unless we can offer all that, then naturally we have to trade with others. And when you trade with others, literally, there is a trade-off. That's what the term trade means. Now, I'm going to press a little bit harder on that complexity because that's kind of really where the billion dollar question is. How do you navigate such a space? How do African states then um, create the conditions to be competitive? Or what are some of the competitive advantages that they have apart from the resources themselves that they can leverage when they're trading off or when they're trading with other partners in the global space? To do justice to the kind of questions you ask, we need to break them down. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to substitute your word with um, not extractives. I'm going to say, for instance, diamonds, because that's more specific. 
So what is it that diamond producers in Africa can do to be competitive? It's a, it's a much more slightly simpler question to answer. Well, the way I see it is that, first of all, we try not to be all things to all people, which is to say, we look at the value chain and we say, in the big scheme of things, based on our own economic needs, in this value chain, where do we want to play? Because if we are competitive in this area, the value we derive is greater. That's the first question. Now, it may be in mining, it may be in cutting and polishing, it may be in jewelry manufacturing. Either way, you zoom in on where you have a comparative advantage because this is where you are likely to compete and succeed relative to others. That would be the approach I would take. I wouldn't try to be everything. I would look at the mineral I have. I would say, where is my greatest? Now, if we stick to the diamond story, upstream, there are very few jobs, but there's revenue, so you're okay. Mm -hmm. Midstream, there's not much. Downstream in the cutting and polishing, there's nearly 800,000 jobs in the world. Now, if you are an African country, that's where you focus in. You develop the skills, you become competitive in that space, you need the jobs, you get the jobs. But you don't try to be everything. You don't try, for instance, and go into jewelry manufacturing, which requires that you are also in the fashion industry because you couldn't compete with Paris, you couldn't compete with New York, you couldn't compete with Tokyo. So that would be my approach. Interesting insight indeed. I'm going to move a little bit uh, towards the debate around how countries balance um, current needs while protecting and providing for generations to come. That's been a big debate in the continent because it seems there are some countries in the, in the world, such as Norway, that have done very well and have managed a pretty sizable sovereign fund. Um, so how do states in countries such as Africa strike such a balance? How do you cater to pressing, immediate, evident, competing needs, which are numerous, while also protecting and providing for generations to come? Uh, so you've used Norway as an example. So uh, remember, Norway has like 4 million plus people. Mm -hmm. So it's a small country by any stretch of imagination. S some African countries have more than uh, 100 million people. So it's not, the dynamic is not exactly the same, I think we need to say. Having said that, there are certain aspects that we can copy from Norway. One of them is really how they manage the state-owned entities. And the way they manage the state-owned entities is separate the business from the politics of oil. That, I think, is one of the things that can be done in Africa, is to manage these entities fundamentally as businesses, not as public utility organizations. This, I think, is a, it's a fundamental uh, essential if we are going to extract the resources mm -hmm. and manage them for future generations, because it means you have to optimize the resources. And it's very difficult to optimize when you're also looking over your shoulder and worrying about politics, because the, in politics, cash isn't key. In politics, the ballot is key. And, and there's a conflict here. When you're trying to run a business and also worried about the ballot, already the board is in trouble in terms of balancing things. So, so excluding politics, I think, would be one. In terms of future generation, my sense is that countries have several options. If you have a small deposit, it's a windfall. What you do is you extract all of it and then you manage the revenue as you have said, sovereign welfare funds and other vehicles. If you have a huge deposit that may last 100 years or more, and they are, then you think about the pace at which you extract the deposits such that there is enough for generations. So again, it, it, there's no one size fits all. You got to look at what is the substance that we're talking about? What is the magnitude of the deposit? And therefore strategically, what are the options we have? It, it would be impossible to say, this is the one that they should do. The key is what I said earlier. You start off by saying, 
we have the deposit. When we are done exploiting it, what do we want to leave? What is that which we want to have? You answer that question, in many ways you answer a lot of the questions you ask me. And that does not happen enough. And that is the duty of a board. And that is why I wrote the book. And that is why the book is free, so that people can read the book, argue with me, disagree, but let's get an answer and move forward anyway. That's a perfect segue to my next question around insecurity and how there have been countries in the continent that have this windfall of resources has come with conflict. And I know that uh, that's not necessarily the case. It's not a blanket uniform. I don't want to perpetrate that that's indeed the case for all countries, but I'd like your two cents on it. What are some of the ways that you know, leadership and governance can tackle or avoid or navigate this space around resources becoming the source of insecurity? You, 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 somehow you, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to argue with you that uh, resources don't cause conflict. It, it, it has to be said outright. Greed causes conflict. Lack of governance causes conflict. And sometimes tribalism also causes conflict. If you, the way I see it, the resources are like your tennis court where the battle takes place. But in effect, the battle is not the tennis court. The battle is the, the hitting of the ball with two, two rivals. So this is how I see the conflict that occurs in resource-rich countries. It is driven by several factors, most of which is poor governance, the tension that results from bad governance, and the, the fracture that follows poor governance leading to people forming themselves into groups with vested interest and nobody really taking responsibility for the, the whole country. And therefore, when people feel left out, they then uh, pull out and they say, we are going to launch a war because we feel left out. And, and so, if we want to address conflict around minerals, we must address inequality, we must address uh, bad human rights, we must address the failure by governments in some countries to demonstrate the value that these resources bring to people. Otherwise, you are literally challenging them to fend for themselves. And their idea of fending for themselves is taking arms. It is not surprising, therefore, that there's a correlation between um, poverty, fragility, and conflict. How then do we secure or encourage or enhance inclusive growth? How do we tackle that? We know that these challenges exist. We know some of the ingredients that make these challenge um, or grow these challenges that most of the African countries who are in conflict or insecurity face. How do we address these? How do we make inclusive growth happen? Uh, in truth, I'm not sure I know. I would be running a country if I knew that. Uh, and all I did was run a few small companies. <laughs> but, but I mean, I think if we govern and respect those principles, if we steward the resources responsibly, which is to say, with a willingness to account to those we represent, if we as a board perform our fiduciary responsibility, which is to say, acting on behalf of others responsibly. My sense is that we reduce, we, we, we reduce potential for conflict, we increase potential for inclusiveness. Now my final question around leadership in the sector, and I know we've, we've touched upon this when we talked about governance and different ways that leaders in the continent can steward uh, resources. Um, but let's get a little bit uh, personal and uh, talk about your leadership journey and how that has been in the sector. And what are some of the advice that you would have for up and coming leaders within the sector? What are some of the things they should look out for? What was your journey like? And what is some of the wisdom that you can share from that journey? So my journey has been very deliberate and conscious. 
conscious that I'm not a career girl. Uh, I, I, I don't really want to be a, a director or CEO or anything. These things are, for me, are just titles. Fundamental, I've always been, been driven by the sense that I do the things I believe in, the things that have meaning to me, and things that contribute s some good. If that lands me in a job with a title, so be it, but that's somebody's title, that's somebody's HR structure. I really do make a distinction between a corporate HR structure and my person. They are mutually exclusive. So my first advice to people is think about who you are and what you want to do. There's many options in the world, but the last thing you want to do is end up in a position where you are doing this because you think others expect you or that they are the right thing to do. So that's, that's the first thing. That's my journey. As I speak with you now, I wrote this book as a public good to give for free because it's the right thing to do. Now, enterprise says I should sell it, but I'm not selling it because I don't believe everything must be sold. And that has always been my, my modus operandi. I do things because they are the right thing to do. Now, what advice I have, by all means enjoy the glory, but this is not a small matter. People depend on you. Companies depend on you, especially in the extractives, especially in companies in which the state has equity. It isn't a badge of honor. It's an enormous responsibility. Prepare, do the right thing. You can't go wrong. Any final words? No, just very happy to speak to Ngozi once again. But uh, I, and I appreciate that you have taken the time to speak with me. And I hope that uh, people will find this book uh, useful. It's not going to answer everybody's questions, but I did try to put enough information there that it will be useful to somebody. And, and uh, so I'll start uploading the chapters month by month uh, on my website at shilakama.com beginning January. And then it's up to people if they wish to read it and we'll take it from there. Thank you very much, Sheila Kama. If you like this program, like, share and subscribe.